One of the most curious things about the town of Morton is its strange insular little rituals. The traditions and festivals that everyone living there knows about, but which to an outsider would seem weird and perhaps even a little unsettling. One such tradition is our Heritage Weekend, taking place every year in May and funded in part by the council, local businesses and charity organizations. It's a celebration of the town's long and storied history that stretches back to the Romans. In practice, the focus is almost always exclusively on the Victorian era, and people take the weekend as a good excuse to dress up in Victorian costume and celebrate what they would refer to as the old-worldly character of the place. People will set up stalls selling Victorian-era cakes with huge jars of old-style sweets like those you would find in an old-time sweet shop painted on a postcard or on an old biscuit tin. The local park is always filled with surviving steam engines, classic cars or bikes, whilst the town square is covered with market stalls selling food. In the last few years, there's also been an area set out for an old-fashioned fairground rides like the Ferris wheel and decidedly dodgy-looking Helter Skelter that I saw being assembled and screwed together by a boy of around 10 years old, which I would never dream of riding. Local attendees go all out on their costumes dressing as everything from chimney sweeps and second-rate Oliver Twists to elaborate decorated ladies, men in top hats, and even Queen Victoria herself. For anyone passing through Morton during the Heritage Weekend who wasn't aware of the tradition or expecting it, I can imagine it makes quite a sight and I'm sure more than one traveler has been forced to look twice as a chimney sweep riding the penny farthing wheeled past them on their way through town. Despite the rumors of odd and sometimes sinister things going on in the town, the Heritage Weekend is one of those few occasions where everyone gets together to celebrate the community that exists in this place. That is not to say, however, that there isn't sometimes the hint of something else amongst the celebrations, the small but definite undercurrent of something dark lurking just below the surface. For me, that something appeared two years ago and may not perhaps have left. I first came across the costume while sifting through donations made for the charity raffle stall. I was alone in one of the upper rooms of the Morton Victorian Library, where I work, standing before several makeshift tables piled high with ornaments, gadgets, books and toys that people had kindly given up so that we could offer them as prizes in the raffle. None of these items was of any particular value, and to be honest, the raffle is more of a joke than a chance to win any real big windfalls. The biggest prize on offer is usually a meat hamper kindly donated by Meredith, the local butchers. But most people walk away with a joke prize like a stuffed dog, an incomplete jigsaw puzzle, or an old lamp that should have found its way to the charity shop or a skip a long time ago. Usually people purchase the tickets just because it goes to a good cause. When they win, they walk up, collect their worthless old prize, and wave above their heads like they've just won the World Cup, whilst everyone else laughs about it. One of those quirky local traditions and usually a lighthearted activity to brighten the day. Having volunteered to help organize this stall, I was tasked with sifting through the items people had donated so that I could attach a raffle ticket to each and put the corresponding ticket into the bucket for the draw. If you have ticket number seven on the day, and seven is picked out, then you will become the proud owner of a 1976 Beano annual that I had taken the time to sellotape the number seven to. See? Easy. Only that night, for whatever reason, the simple act of attaching the tickets to the items seemed like a struggle. First of all, there were the noises. Though I was alone in the room, alone in the entire building in fact, everyone else having gone home at five, I couldn't help thinking that as I moved around the table, I could hear someone muttering somewhere behind me. A low, gurgling voice, unmistakably male, but speaking words that I couldn't quite make out. Several times I became distracted by this sound and stopped what I was doing so as to better hear where the sound was coming from. Every time I stopped, the sound would cease too. Though I'll admit, I was a little unnerved by this. It was the sudden feeling of fatigue that worried me the most. All at once, for no reason at all, 
sticking on the ticket seemed like the worst possible chore. I could feel myself struggling to lift the items, dragging my limbs as if they were three times their normal weight and I was wading through treacle. I felt my breathing becoming labored and a heavy, almost overwhelming tiredness coming over me. I'm not a young man and honestly became a little worried that if I did become faint and fall over, I wouldn't be found until the next morning. I certainly didn't want to fall whilst I was alone up there, so I took a seat to rest. For a moment, I wondered if I might be coming down with a cold or flu or something, but my temperature seemed normal. Eventually, I decided that I would forget the whole thing until the following day and come back to the task when there were more people around. It was as I stood up to leave that I noticed the furry bundle crumpled in a pile on one of the hard wooden chairs in the corner. Lifting it up to examine it, I recognized that it was some kind of monkey suit, or more accurately, an ape, a chimpanzee or orangutan. It had also definitely seen better days. The suit itself, a full-length overall with buttons running up the back, was covered all over with reddish-brown hair that was literally worn to balding in some spots, like the elbows and knees. In other places, it was matted and wadded together with God knew what substances and looked as if no amount of cleaning would ever get that hair untangled. The mask, which made up the head of the creature, was a hideously crude thing, clearly constructed by someone who had never seen an ape in real life, but who might once have seen a drawing of one. The eyes were huge circular things like buttons, a white ring around a stark blue center. The nose was wide and consisted of two deep nostrils carved out of a lightweight wood whilst the mouth, which extended almost from one cloth ear to the other, was stuffed with triangular sharp teeth, framed with huge red lips like something from a Punch and Judy show. In fact, it was at last thought, the similarity between the half-carved mask and the smile of Mr. Punch that made me reevaluate things in a different light. Clearly, this costume has been donated by someone in the local area, meaning that more than likely it had been in the area for some time. It was also, judging by the state of it, a costume of some considerable age. I therefore wondered whether this might not be a genuine piece of Morton heritage. If the thing actually dated back to the early 1900s or even earlier, then it belonged not on the raffle but on one of the heritage stalls set up by the town's local historians, like my friend Archie. Lifting the head, I turned it in my hands and looked again into those large circular eyes, which stared back from atop that wide, manic grin in a glaring cold Atlantic blue. For a second, I thought of trying the thing on, but the arrival of another sound, like that of a voice echoing somewhere in the building, persuaded me not to, and instead I left the thing there on the chair and went home. That night, instead of sticking raffle tickets on prizes, I called Archie Tanner to tell him about the costume and ask him if he might be interested in having a look. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, Archie seemed to almost dive down the phone line with excitement. Chalky chimp, he shouted excitedly down the phone, to almost no reaction from me. When I asked what he was talking about, he hesitated and then asked if he could come over to show me something. Since I was feeling much better than I had in the upstairs rooms, I said that would be fine and invited him to come over, provided he brought a few bottles of decent beer with him. When he arrived, Archie had far more than beer under his arms. What he showed me were books, each of them filled with photographs of Morton from years gone by, beginning with grainy color, fading to black and white and eventually blurring into indistinct hues of sepa and brown. You remember there used to be a jungle gym here in Morton, a kid's play area, like a ball pit and stuff? He asked enthusiastically. I nodded that I had a vague notion that such a place existed, and Archie grinned. Well, before the new owners took it over, that place was called Chalky Chimps. It was called that because it was named after a character called Chalky who would dive about with the kids when they played, usually some teenager dressed up in a costume. I nodded seeing that Archie had clearly identified where the suit had come from, but not quite following why he was so excited about it. Thing is, the suit isn't named after the character, it's the other way around. When Carol and Mike bought the place to make it into a jungle gym, 
they found the monkey suit stuffed in an old cupboard with a tag attached to it that said, Chalky. So they decided that would be a good name and a good idea to build the place around. What's even more interesting, though, is that that costume isn't just a lot older than the jungle gym, it's older than most of this town. Flipping through books, Archie showed me various photographs. Some were from heritage weekends in the past, others of carnivals, town fets, and other events held in the town square or in the park. What linked the photographs, other than the fact that I could recognize the setting, was that in every single one, in the background, standing off to one side or holding the hand of a small child, was the round-eyed smile and tattered furry face of Chalky staring out at me. For years I've been trying to get Carol and Mike to let me borrow the costume for the Heritage Weekends, to put it on a stall or have someone dress up in it as part of the tradition, but they always had kids' parties booked those days and needed Chalky to make an appearance. Now though we can go ahead with it. They must have thrown the costume out when the place closed down. I looked again at the photographs. At one from 1896 were men in top hats and tails holding canes and standing beside women in elaborate high neck dresses were joined by this hideous grinning ape. Almost immediately I began to feel uneasy. I didn't know they even knew about chimpanzees that early. I laughed mirthlessly, swinging one of the beers Archie had donated. He shook his head and explained that if you go back even further, the costume still turns up in photos and before that in paintings and leaflets. Honestly, I'm not sure it was always meant to be a chip, he announced flatly. A costume really similar to this thing was worn in the old mystery plays and we're talking pre-Shakespeare there. I mean, I don't think this costume is that old, but it's probably based on something like that, he said authoritatively. And what was it meant to be in those plays, I asked, assuming it would be a generic monkey costume. Not sure, Archie replied, still flicking through the books for more men in monkey costumes. It's usually some kind of beast or monster or something, a devil or a demon maybe. The plays were mostly religious. Sometimes when they did pageants about the lives of the saints, they would have a dark thing hobbling behind to scare the kids straight. They didn't mess about in those olden days. He chuckled and swinged again at his beer. Despite Archie's assurances that the costume couldn't possibly be that old, something about this latest revelation made my skin crawl. I kept thinking back to those mad staring eyes, that too wide grin and the teeth, which, unlike any real monkeys, were sharpened to vicious angular points. I thought of the images of this creature, or at least of the man dressed up as it, holding the child's hand and leading them away from the crowd. I don't mind telling you, the whole thought gave me shivers. It wasn't until the following evening, however, that I took a real dislike to that natty old rag that someone would call a costume. I had finished my shift in the library itself, seen the rest of the staff off with a good night's wish, and was about to ascend the stairs to carry on with the labeling when the library desk phone rang. Walking wearily over to answer it, I perked up slightly when I heard Archie's voice on the other end. What he had to say, however, did not put me in a good mood. First he asked if I still had the costume. When I said that it should still be upstairs, he paused for a long time. Then he explained that rather than having anyone wear it, he was considering donating it to another museum somewhere down south. When I asked him why he had changed his mind about including it in the Heritage Weekend, he said that he had done a little more research. According to Archie, my odd feeling about the photographs and the gruesome appearance of Chalky was not entirely wide of the mark. In fact, before it was locked away in a cupboard for decades and used as a costume at a jungle gym, the costume and Chalky himself had quite a sinister reputation. Despite the fact that the monkey, creature, or whatever it was supposed to be could clearly be seen in all those old photographs, there was no record of him ever being listed as one of the performers. We generally have quite detailed records of this stuff, Archie said forcefully. Every stall, every juggler, every clown, and every musician is listed because their performances were considered charitable donations. They are all listed in the programs and running orders, but nowhere does the name Chalky or the word monkey appear. Worse than that, there were a number of occasions where at these big villa feats, children either went missing, drowned, or were badly injured or brutalized allegedly by an adult 
or in some cases, an animal. In every case, spread over the years, the man leading the kitties away was said to be wearing an old animal costume. For a few years, there was actually a rule in town that nobody at a public event was permitted to wear a mask or any covering that might obscure their face. In those years, there were no photographs of the suit. After a while, the real costume disappeared altogether, but the idea that Chalky might be a threat became sort of a myth. According to Archie, for years in Morton the name, Chalky was used as a sort of local boogeyman, a thing that hid under bridges or in storerooms near the mills. We've got school books from Victorian children where they write poems and stories about nannies who said that if they don't behave, Chalky's going to get you. There's even a few drawings of them. I'll show them to you one day. But you wouldn't like how they look. I guess almost immediately that Archie was probably right about that. Having heard what he had to say, I decided that I would pack the costume away in a large carrier bag, store it away from the other items, and pass it on to Archie as soon as possible. When I opened the door to the upstairs room, however, I instantly changed my mind. For there, in the corner of the room, still on the wooden chair, was the tattered old chalky costume exactly where I'd left it. The only difference being that now, the suit was sitting up. Somebody was wearing it. For a moment, I stood transfixed upon what I was seeing, but then the head turned. Those circular eyes and the jagged red-lipped smile fixed on me, and I'm not ashamed to say that I ran. I hurtled so fast down the wooden stairs that I almost tipped and fell. Unfastening the lock to the library door, I didn't even bother to turn off the lights, but shot out into the street and hurtled breathlessly into town. When I returned the following day with Archie in tow, the costume was gone. Whether someone snuck into the upstairs room and decided to give me a fright, I don't know though I can't for the life of me work out how they could have gotten past me and up the stairs without me seeing them, nor how they could have gotten out of the library that night after I locked the doors on my way out. Nothing else was disturbed or taken, just the costume. That was almost two years ago. During the pandemic, the Heritage Weekend was cancelled. This year, it has been rescheduled for August. I will be attending but I will also be keeping a very close eye on the crowd, looking out for anything suspicious, and particularly for anyone wearing a tattered old costume of Chalky the Chimp, or whatever kind of creature that suit was really supposed to be.